Amen. Amen. Thank you, Ben. Well, there's, there's nothing greater that you can have in life than a relationship with Jesus Christ. Um, I wanted to give a quick uh, report. Uh, Beth Jacobson uh, continues to improve, and uh, she will be moving to another facility on May the 6th, closer to Annapolis. Uh, got a report from her son, Kai, uh, last night, and uh, just continued to pray uh, for this uh, just great sister in the Lord is um, that she would continue to make strides. She's a little more open for visitors, and uh, you can check with the office if you want information on that. Um, I, was, I was thinking this morning, um, the thought came to me, how should we all be listening to God's Word this morning? And, and the, the thought that came to me is that we should listen to the Word of God as one who is hearing how to find great treasure. Um, if someone were to tell you there's uh, a treasure that's worth a billion dollars, that's a thousand million dollars, and if you will just listen carefully to my instructions, uh, I'll show you how to get it. We, we ought to be listening to the Word of God just like that because it is such a great treasure. In Psalm 119, uh, verse 72, it says, The law of your mouth, the word of God, is better than thousands of gold and silver pieces. 162, I rejoice in your word as one who finds great spoil. We ought to listen to the word of God as if it is uh, uh, the greatest treasure we could ever acquire. So in that spirit, would you please stand up? We're going to read the word of God. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 50 through 58. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 50 through 58, one of the richest passages of Scripture in all of God's Word, starting in verse 50. Paul writes, Now I say this, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep. But we will all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. For this perishable must put on the imperishable, and this mortal must put on immortality. But when the, this perishable will have put on the imperishable, and this mortal will have put on immortality, then will come about the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, because of all of this, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your toil is not in vain, in the Lord. Would you pray with me? Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you for the truth of your word, and I pray that your Holy Spirit would make it come alive to, to our lives, that, that we would just connect with this great treasure that you've set before us this morning. Uh, we continue to pray for Beth Jacobson, Lord, healing for her, and Lord, we pray for healing for hearts here today as we uh, see Jesus. Lord, uh, thank you for what you're able to do, uh, exceeding abundantly beyond what we can ever ask or think. And we just pray that you would have your way in each heart here this morning. In Jesus' name, and all God's people said, amen. Please be seated. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, uh, we've looked at for the last month is a chapter that is dealing mostly with the future. Uh, we've been looking ahead into the future for the believer in Jesus Christ. And we have not only seen uh, amazing things concerning where we will live in the future, but what you'll be like, what will you, your, your body will actually be like in the future. Uh, the, the experience that, that lies ahead for us as believers in Jesus Christ uh, is truly amazing grace. Uh, truly, these truths are, are treasures and, and sometimes almost too wonderful to take in. 
and and yet I I've found that not uh, everybody is interested in what happens after we die. Uh, in fact, most people today, even people that attend churches, seem to be a lot more interested in what goes on right here and now. Uh, I heard somebody say recently, isn't it odd in our prayers that we spend most of the time praying to keep people out of heaven who are headed there than we do for lost people, praying them into heaven who aren't headed there? Isn't that the truth? Um, I think sometimes we lose sight of the glories of heaven, even as we pray for saints, resisting in some ways what is the very best. The very best thing is going to happen to you is when you die. For me to die is, it is to live as Christ, to die is gain, the Apostle Paul said. You know, I, I've just been reminded as I've gone through this study of 1 Corinthians of a song that I used to sing as a young Christian, Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus. You've heard that song? Look full in His wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of His glory and grace. The, the last phrase, the things of this earth will grow strangely dim in the light of His glory and grace. You know, if we really understood the grace of God and the gift that has been given to us, if we would be obedient to 2 Peter 3.18, which says, grow in the grace and the knowledge of the Lord Jesus and understand what lies ahead for us, what we have already received as Christians in the light of all that Jesus has done, the things of earth would grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. But they're not very dim, are they? <laughs> the, I mean, I'm talking about the things of this world. The things of this world to most of us are vivid and sharp and huge and occupying almost the entire screen of our mind. The things of this world. We're, 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 we're so consumed with getting this, having that, going here, going there, consumed with our current situation, with money and things. We're so wrapped up in, in this world that we fail to consider the next and th this chapter has been discussing what things will be like for us in the next world. A world that, that really could come soon for any one of us. Soon because of the return of Christ or soon because of an unexpected death. The transition from this world to the next. The, the title of this message is a trans transition to transformation and then ultimately to triumph. It is a, a transition to a change. In fact, the change for us, where we're going, is going to be so wonderful that we will have to have new bodies to be able to experience it. And it will happen, perhaps very soon, for some of us here in this room. Who knows? Um, dear ones, we are living in a, in a very difficult world. That, that's not a newsflash for any of us. Uh, we who live so close to the city of Baltimore know that for sure. Just 30 minutes from a city that has been burning with fire, burning with anger that is spilled out into the streets. Uh, we are seeing in vivid technicolor what happens to a nation which for many years now has left all the vestiges of the righteous foundation upon which this country was built on the Word of God. I, I, I have just finished in my Bible reading through the year uh, the books of First and Second Kings, First and Second Chronicles. Incredible story. I feel like, felt like I was reading about America in these books. You see it over and over again, what happened to the nation of Israel. After being successful, they were filled with pride, they turned their back on God. They decided they did not need Him and turned to the worship of idols that they had created with their own hands and suffered terrible consequences. When the leaders became corrupt, the people who followed them were corrupt and they suffered greatly. And I believe so it is in our country. Corrupt leadership, corrupt judges who have turned their back on the Bible, we are now living in a nation filled with injustice, corrupt leaders, corrupt laws, corrupt government trying to control a corrupted people, 
people filled with unrighteousness. It is, folks, it's not a pretty world. It's heartbreaking. And it's not a stable world. I mean, just, just a, not too many days ago, a, an earthquake in Nepal wiped out five to 10,000 people. Boom, just like that. And I would just say this, if current events don't cause you to stop and consider eternity, I don't know what will. Now, we're going to consider this morning a very specific moment in history, a moment in the history of the world where something monumental is going to take place, the greatest human transformation that has ever occurred. It will come so flat, fast that if you blink, you will miss it. And it's a moment that will only be experienced by a select group of people. And this moment that is coming is perhaps the single most motivating factor for my life and your life right now to live a life of meaning and purpose. And I want you to see four things from this text that we've just read concerning this great transformation that is soon to take place. I want you to see the demand for it, the description of it, the declaration, and the dedication of this transformation. So let's jump in. The demand for the transformation, verse 50. Paul says, Now I I say this, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. This this verse reveals that that if something doesn't happen to you, you'll never see heaven. You'll never go to heaven. Paul's saying it it is impossible for flesh and blood to inherit the kingdom of God. And when he's talking about flesh and blood here, uh, so far as we're concerned, it's, it's uh, an expression of our physical, natural relationship to Adam. He's talking about our mortal body. He's speaking about this body right now that you see in front of you and you're, that's sitting in your chair. And, and verse 50 is saying this, that, that a body of flesh and blood, sometimes the word flesh is used in a moral sense, but whenever... It's used flesh and blood. It always refers to the body. And he's saying that this kind of body cannot inherit the kingdom of God, that sphere which is spiritual, immortal, and eternal. We need a new nature. We need a new body if we're to go to live where Jesus is now. Uh, Jesus set forth this great demand in in John chapter 3 and verse 3 when he said, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a person is born again... He cannot see the kingdom of heaven. And, and, and what, what John is saying here is for a person to see the kingdom of God, he must experience a radical transformation that's so radical it can only be described as a new birth. It's a transformation that first takes place on the inside, but then must also take place on the outside. Ultimately, a person must be born again to a new physical form to be able to see the kingdom of heaven. Because flesh and blood, this body, cannot inherit the kingdom of God. I I think it's interesting when you look at Jesus post-resurrection, when he walked into the upper room with his disciples and he showed himself for the first time, he referred to himself as flesh and bones and not flesh and blood. Now, now that is not to say that Jesus in his incarnation did not have a body just like yours and mine. He, he had a body of, of flesh and, and blood that pu- pu- pulsed through his veins that was poured out on Calvary and paid the price for our sins. In Hebrews chapter 2, uh, verse 14, it says, Since then the children, the children of Adam, share in flesh and blood, He likewise partook of the same. Jesus had a flesh and blood body. But I think when he refers to him after the resurrection as flesh and bones, it's an inference that the resurrection body operating according to different laws, supernatural laws, perhaps has no more need for blood. But but I, I think what Jesus is, what this is saying is that Jesus in order for him to return to heaven, had to have the resurrection body that is suited for heaven and not a body of flesh and blood. And aren't you glad? I I don't know about you. I'm kind of glad that I'm not taking this body to heaven. I'm glad your body ain't going to be there either. So we see the demand for the transformation. Verse 53, for this perishable must 
put on the imperishable. This mortal must put on immortality. You can't go to heaven in this body. Got it? Okay. Let's look at the description now of the transformation when the body's going to be transformed. Verse 51. He says, Behold, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. For this perishable must put on the imperishable, this mortal must put on immortality. I want you to see four factors about this uh, tremendous transformation. First, I want you to see its mystery. He says here, Behold, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed. Now, remember the word mystery there uh, is not something you cannot know. I lost my wedding ring out in this parking lot somewhere, somehow, and folks, it is a mystery where that thing is. I, I, I can't find it. That's not what we're talking about. I, I have a new one, by the way. Thank you very much. Uh, but a mystery in the Bible is something that was hidden in the past, but has now been revealed. And, and the great mystery of this transformation is something that we would call the rapture. The great mystery that was hidden in the Old Testament has now been revealed to us in the New Testament is that, listen now, there will be an entire generation of Christians who will not experience physical death. Behold, I tell you a mystery. I'm revealing it to you now. We will not all sleep. And sleep is a euphemism for death. We are not all going to die physically. I want you to turn to, to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 if you have your Bible. Uh, now, think with me. It's, it's a reasonable inference. Doesn't it stand to reason that if the resurrection of the dead is going to take place at a point some point in human history that there will still be living believers on the earth at that time. Uh, it stands to reason that there will be, if, if the resurrection were to occur today, there are many believers who are still alive right now. And, and the question that, that Paul is dealing with here in 1 Corinthians 15 is, what's going to happen to them? What's going to happen to living believers when the, the day of Christ's return and the day of resurrection comes, will, will they have to die and then be raised from the dead like everybody else? And that hardly seems likely. What will happen to them, the answer is not resurrection. The answer is rapture. They, they will not sleep. They will not die. God will make a provision for those who are still living at the time of the resurrection. And if there's any doubt to the certainty of this, look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 15. And get your pencil out. It says, For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that, underline, we who are alive and remain, we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will not precede those who have fallen asleep, those who are in the grave. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first, and then, underline it again, we who are alive and remain will be caught up, caught up, that's the rapture, together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we'll always be with the Lord. Now listen, the mystery here is that there will be rapture for some, and, but renewal for all. I, I tell you a mystery, we're not all going to die. But we will all be changed. And last week, we, we talked about just how dramatic this change would be. We talked about your resurrection body. It's going to be so different from these bodies. And, and we said that it's going to be like a caterpillar that has changed from a hairy, dirty, crawling worm to a beautiful, flying butterfly. It's, you're, it's just going to be dramatic, the change. And... and um, but the change of a, of a caterpillar to a butterfly is a process that takes time. It takes weeks. I've watched that process take place in a little thing and watched a, a caterpillar, you know, burst out and, and become a butterfly. It takes, it takes several weeks. But, but the question now is, how fast is our transformation going to occur from, from these bodies to our new body? Let's look at its minuteness. It says... Paul says, in a moment, 
in the, it's, it's going to occur in the twinkling of an eye. The word translated moment there is the word atomos, from which we get our English word atom. It, it literally meant that which cannot be divided. The atom for centuries was considered the, the smallest particle of matter. Uh, it, it meant in the Greek understanding you couldn't get anything smaller than an atom. So, so it indicates the shortest possible time that, that, that cannot be divided. It's not an hour. It's not a minute. It's not a second. It's not a nanosecond. It's the smallest possible undividable unit of time. That's what he's talking about. And the, the analogy here is the twinkling. It'll be in, happen in the twinkling of an eye. And that's, that's not a blink with your eyelids. Uh, it's, it's a twinkling. That's a flash of light, a sudden flash of light in the eye. There is one writer who has suggested, and I don't know how in the world he came up with this, that the twinkling of an eye takes a sixth of a nanosecond. <laughs> that is the time that it takes for light to enter the iris and reach the retina. A, a microsecond is one millionth of a second. A nanosecond is one thousandth of a microsecond. And the twinkling of an eye is one sixth of a nanosecond. That's fast. <laughs> that is fast. And Paul's saying that uh, this, that the transformation of our bodies will take place in a split nanosecond, the time for it takes your eye to sparkle. You could be walking along one moment, and the next moment, boom, I mean, you can't, it's that slow. I mean, it's going to happen that fast. You will be changed from this perishable to an imperishable body that is equipped for heaven in, in, in just a moment. So that, that's how fast it's going to happen. It's going to happen fast. And you won't know what hit you. <laughs> you say, well, when is it going to happen? Let's look not at its minuteness, but at its minute. It, he says it's going to happen at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound. The change will occur at the last trumpet. And, and I, I don't think this is the last trumpet, the last heavenly trumpet that will ever be sounded because we know in the book of Revelation uh, during the tribulation period, there will be trumpets of judgment that will sound. This will, however, be the last, as far as living Christians are concerned, for it will sound the end of the church age, when all believers, all, Christ, all members of the church will be removed from the earth. The Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and the trumpet of God. You say, well, Bill, what's going to happen in this miracle, in this, this moment? What's the miracle? Let's look at its miracle now. And here it comes in verses 52 and 53. It says, and in this, this moment, at the trumpet, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will all be changed. The word change there literally means to make it other than it is. We'll be made other than we are right now. The miracle is that in a moment, you could be walking in a perishable, corrupt, decaying, dying body, and in a split nanosecond, you could be transformed into this new body that will never die and never age. You, you could be transformed into a body so beautiful that if you were to look in a mirror, it would take your breath away. Have you ever been in a room when a beautiful woman walks in? I experience that every day. Uh, and it just kind of takes your breath away. You're me, baby. <laughs> your body will be far more beautiful than the most beautiful woman who ever walked the face of the earth who's sitting back there. And, and comparatively, the most beautiful person who ever lived is going to look like a toad compared to you and to your body. It will, the miracle will be a body so powerful, so beautiful, so powerful that it will not be restricted by the limitations of the flesh. If you want to go to some distant galaxy, you can be there with a thought. That's what it means to have a spiritual body. This is going to be a miraculous moment. I mean, you're going to be changed into that, that fast. Now, it's interesting to me that the word translated put on, this mortal must put on immortality is used for putting on clothes. And it pictures our redeemed spirits being dressed with these new redeemed bodies. Your, your new body is going to be a glorious new suit of clothes 
for the real you. It will be a great transformation for you, certainly. But let me tell you, folks, and get this, the greatest transformation that will ever take place in your life is the transformation of your heart that happens right now when you're on this earth. The biggest transformation in a person's life occurs when upon hearing the gospel, that person repents. You know what heaven is? Heaven is a kingdom. Uh, and in a kingdom, there's a king. And you know what? You're not it, and I'm not it in the kingdom of heaven. When you, the most radical change that ever takes place in a person's life is when they step off the throne of their heart and yield to King Jesus. And folks, there is the select company of people that are going to experience this moment. They're going to experience this new body. Those who have repented of their sins because of the gospel and received Jesus as Lord and Savior. Now look, uh, let's look at the declaration of this transformation. There is an incredible declaration a victory over death in verses 54 through 57. But before we see it, um, let me tell you about an amazing preacher that I just read about recently. Listen to this about this preacher. He's, he's amazing. There's a preacher of the old school, but he speaks as boldly as ever. He's not popular, though the world is his parish. And he travels every part of the globe and speaks in every language. This preacher visits the poor, calls on the rich, preaches to people of every religion and no religion. And the subject of this preacher's sermons is always the same. He is an eloquent preacher, often stirring feelings which no other preacher could, bringing tears to eyes that never weep. His arguments none are able to refute, nor is there any heart that has remained unmoved by the force of his appeals. He shatters life with his message. Most people hate him. Everybody fears him. This preacher's name is death. And every tombstone is his pulpit. Every newspaper prints his text. And every day more people are a part of his message. The inevitability of death. We fear it. We hide from it. We evade it. We try to avoid it. We mask it because it, death devastates us. It breaks long, loving unions. It leaves unfinished symphonies. It removes people who are greatly needed. It wrecks our tra tranquility. It is our enemy. Think about it, folks, even now. Death is the enemy of man. Even for Christians, it is the source of great pain because it breaks and disrupts love relationships. It disrupts families. It causes grief to those dearest to us. We no longer, listen now, we no longer need to fear death, but and it still invades and torments us while we're in these mortal bodies. But only until then. Only until the great moment of this miracle. Once this miracle we've been talking about, once that in a moment twinkling of an eye happens, death's dominion is over. And look at verse 54, it says, But when, when this perishable will have put on the imperishable, and this mortal will have put on immortality, then will come about the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? For the sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. The, the, the expression death is swallowed up seems to indicate that death and all that it is, all that it has ever done is obliterated and wiped out in that one moment. R.C. Linsky, commentator, writes, death is not merely destroyed so that it can do no further harm while all the harm it has wrought on God's children remains. Listen, the tornado is not merely checked so that no additional homes are wrecked while those who were wrecked still lie in ruin. That's not what this means. He says death and all of its apparent victories are totally undone for God's children. Isn't that awesome? 
What looks like a victory for death and like a defeat for us when our bodies die and decay shall be reversed so that death dies in absolute defeat and our bodies reign in absolute victory. Death is swallowed up in victory. And then, and then he says this. He says, oh, death. He is taunting now. He's trash talking now with death. He's saying, oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? Adrian Rogers calls this the twofold anthem of the redeemed. Oh, death, where is your victory? Where is your sting? He says, if Jesus were to come today, there would be two categories of individuals. First, there would be those who would say, oh, death, where is your sting? Those of us who are alive, uh, if Jesus were to come right now, would never feel the sting of death. So we could rise in the air to meet the Lord and say, death, where is your sting? But then the other believers who have died and are now in the grave, they could come out of the grave and say to death, Death, you didn't hold me. Oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? You couldn't sting me, one will say. You couldn't hold me, the other will say, those who come out of the grave. And you know, it's interesting, both categories of men are uh, seen on the Mount of Transfiguration. In Matthew 17, you guys remember that story? Who shows up with Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration? Moses and Elijah appeared. How did Elijah go to heaven? Elijah never died. He was caught up in a whirlwind, in a chariot of fire, and went directly to heaven without ever dying. He represents the crowd that will say, Death, where's your sting? You didn't get me. And then there's Moses, the Moses crowd. Moses, we know, died. Oh, death, where is your victory? You say, Bill, when is all this going to happen? It's going to happen at the last trump. We don't know exactly when, but we do know this. Folks, get this one. It's sooner than it's ever been. It's closer than it's ever been today. Now, now watch this. Verse 56 interprets verse 55. He says, the sting of death is sin. The power of sin is the law. Death and sin and the law are the terrible trio for the unbeliever. The law activates sin, and sin activates death. It, it is not death that harms us. Death has no power unless, unless there is uh, something called sin. sin. Sin is death's stinger. Death has no power unless there's unforgiven sin in a person's life. Wherever there's unforgiven sin in a person's life, death is absolutely deadly. For a person who has yet to repent and to receive the forgiveness of Jesus Christ, death is eternally deadly. And then he goes on to say the power of sin is the law. The law is the, the standard that reveals that we're sinners. The law sets the mark that sin misses. The law, we, we know this, folks, the law activates sin. Romans chapter 7, verse 9, Paul said, I was once alive apart from the law, but when the commandment came, sin became alive in me. The law stirs up within us that inbred rebellion that is, that is called sin. When I see a sign that says, don't walk on the grass, or don't touch the paint, I could have had no interest in that at all. I suddenly want to do it. And so do you. The law activates sin, and sin in turn activates death. Now watch this. The only way that we could ever be delivered from the fear of death is for someone to fulfill the law for us. Because the law makes two demands. The law demands perfection. In order for me to escape the judgment and the condemnation of God, I must keep the law perfectly with no sin. James 2.10 says, whoever keeps the whole law stumbles in one point has become guilty of all. The law demands perfection. And then the law demand, demands punishment if I am not perfect. Two demands of the law, perfection and punishment. The first demand, perfection. And if you are not perfect, the second demand, the law demands punishment. And the punishment of the law is death spiritual, physical, eternal death in an everlasting hell. Now, now listen to verses 56 and then 57. The sting of death is sin. The power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through 
our Lord Jesus Christ. Folks, how can you, how can I have victory over sin and death? It is through the Lord Jesus Christ who fulfilled all of the law's demands for me. First, he fulfilled the law's demand for perfection. He lived in the same world that we live in with laws and boundaries and temptations, all of them that we face, and he never once sinned. And then, after fulfilling the law's demand for perfection, he offered himself to fulfill the law's demand for our punishment on a Roman cross, suffering the agony of a spiritual, physical, and eternal death as he hung on the cross. Galatians 3.13 says this, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. The curse of the law is death eternal death. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us, for cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. Because Jesus suffered and bled and died on Calvary, he purchased my forgiveness, and he has forever removed my sin, and death for me as a believer no longer has any sting. The small, listen, folks, the smallest sin unforgiven has the power to kill a soul eternally. If you have not received the forgiveness of Christ, death is an incredible threat. Unless you're forgiven, death, when it hits you, will sting you with eternal kill power. If you know Christ, sin's not an issue anymore. Death has no sting Adrian Rogers tells a story of a little boy and a little girl that were playing out in the garden. And a big bumblebee came up and stung the little boy on his arm. And of course, he started to cry and the place swelled up. And his mother ran out uh, to minister first aid to him. And then all of a sudden, his little sister started to cry too. And she seemed to be more frightened than the little boy was. And her mom said, honey, what, what are you crying about? She said, because that bee that stung my brother, he's still buzzing around and he could sting me. And mother said, sweetheart, you see right there, look at your brother's arm. See right there? Uh, The stinger is right in his arm. He took that stinger and that old bee, when he stung your brother, lost its stinger and he'll never sting anybody again. I'm I'm gonna tell you folks for us, The old bee called death may buzz around you, but Jesus Christ took the stinger out of death. Jesus took the sting out at the cross. He took the the gloom out of the grave. He took the pain out of the parting now. And he gives us a hope that is steadfast and sure. No wonder Paul busts out in verse 57 and says, but thanks be to God who gives us the victory through Jesus Christ our Lord. Now look at verse 58, and let's look at one final thing, the great dedication of the transformation. The the, the great truth of this transition to transformation and triumph ought to lead us to dedicate ourselves to the work of the Lord. Look, Look at verse 58. Therefore, my beloved, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your toil is not in vain in the Lord. I love that word, therefore, because it looks back at at everything that Paul has just said, all 57 preceding verses. It's a hinge word, therefore, that, that joins the doctrinal to the practical. It's a hinge between doctrine and duty. It it is between truth and application. Paul's looking back and saying, look back, therefore, because this is a reality, here now is your responsibility. And let's summarize what Paul's been saying to the Corinthians and to us in these first 57 verses. He's saying, therefore, because Jesus has fulfilled the law's demand on you for your perfection and your punishment, you are no longer unforgiven. You're forgiven. You're not guilty. Jesus took the stinger out of death for you at the cross. There's no sting in death for you. Therefore, 
because one day, either if you die physically or you remain alive until the coming of the Lord, something's going to happen to you in an instant that is going to be so fabulous in less than a nanosecond. Your body's going to be transformed into a body that can live in heaven where God is. And you'll receive this, this incorruptible body that'll never die, a glorious body that's going to be so beautiful, a body so powerful and spiritual that you will go to the Father's house. Or that Jesus has been preparing a place for you. There, guys, look up here. There's three rapture passages in Scripture. We've, we've already looked at two of them. 1 Corinthians 15 and 1 Thessalonians 4. There's a third rapture passage in John 14. And listen to what Jesus says in John 14. In my Father's house, there are many dwelling places. If it weren't so, I would have told you. And I'm going to prepare a place for you and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself. That's rapture, that where I am, there you may be also. And what Paul is saying here in verse 58 is, therefore, because this is true, what should I be doing now? Well, here it is. Because all of this is true, be steadfast and movable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your toil for the Lord is not in vain. Be steadfast, that means be fixed, firm, and settled. Be seated in this truth. Uh, Paul's saying everything that you've just heard, all the proof, the evidence, the, the resurrection is a reality. Be settled in your conviction that one day, because Jesus was raised from the dead, you're going to be raised from the dead. Be steadfast and immovable. Don't move from that truth. Stay fixed on that great truth. Think of it often and then do something. Do what? Well, he says then always abound in the work of the Lord. Always abounding. That word, you know what the word abounding means there? Overdo it. That's what it means. Don't just do the work of the Lord. Overdo it. That he's saying here that you cannot work too hard doing the work of the Lord. And of course, I asked the question this week as I was studying this, Lord, what is your work? And I was led to this passage in John 4, 35 and 36, where Jesus said, Do you not say that there are yet four months to the harvest? Behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields that they are white for the harvest. Already he who reaps is receiving wages and is gathering fruit for life eternal. You know what the work of the Lord is for us? is to be a part of a team that is gathering fruit for life eternal and the fields are white for the harvest. There are men and women that need to know Jesus Christ to receive the gift of eternal life. And there's no greater need that anybody has out here, there, or anybody in here than the need for eternal life. The great work is to be a part of a team called the church to gather people for eternal life. Folks, I don't know if, you know, we've been talking about answers for Baltimore, answers for Baltimore. There is no answer for Baltimore except eternal life. People with eternal life don't loot and steal and throw bricks and, uh, bricks and set things on fire. And on the other side of the equation, people with eternal life on the police side do not treat those they are supposed to protect unjustly. There's only one hope for our city, our state, and that's the eternal life that Jesus provides, the eternal life that can begin to be experienced right now in the soul and the spirit, the eternal life that one day in heaven will experience a resurrection body. It is a life that is submitted to the Word of God. And, and we as those who have received this lavish grace, that have this great moment this instantaneous moment waiting for us should spare no effort, no, no, no money, no time to do the work of the Lord, knowing that our work for Him is not in vain. We should seek out every opportunity to do the work of the Lord. And the, the great work is allowing God to use your gifts, your talents, your resources, your words, your actions to lead others toward their next step in following Jesus Christ to the place where they will bow the knee to King Jesus. That's the work. I tell you, if we could see as God sees, 
and we're looking through a glass darkly, we would spare no effort in being involved in the work of evangelism, this great work. Take advantage of the opportunities that are before you. Look up, the fields are white for the harvest. Would you stand with me? And let's pray. Lord Jesus, how, how we thank you uh, for taking the sting out of eternal death. Lord, thank you f- that you lived the life I couldn't live, a life of perfection under the law for the very reason that you would suffer the punishment that I deserve that you don't deserve. Lord, we know that, that this life as a Christian is all grace. We don't deserve it. And I thank you, Lord, that you, you took the stinger out of death, that we don't have to fear it anymore. And I thank you that one day, perhaps very soon, <clears throat> you're coming. Whether we, we die or are still alive, that this, this rapture event awaits every single person who has repented and bowed the knee to King Jesus, to you, Lord. Thank you that, that we are one day going to have a body that is going to be just like your resurrection body, a body that's so amazing where our redeemed spirit has a redeemed suit of clothes that is fabulous. And Lord, knowing all of this, knowing the grace that we've received, would you just by your Holy Spirit grant us to be steadfast and movable in this conviction, um, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Lord, Lord, Just don't allow us to waste time, the time that we have left in this life. It's so short. And I pray that we would would see the opportunities before us and, um, and abound in the work, Lord, for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen.